Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see you. I'm sorry we're getting a little bit of a late start, but um, it's nice to have time to talk and fellowship uh, before we get together for this gathering. So um, I hope you're okay with all that. We'll just still, we'll still end at uh, 1230. So today I was trying in my sermon to just ask a really basic question, like what is the fall really all about? Like what was the problem, <laughs> right? And like we hear, we hear talk about the fall or our fallen nature or you know, we use language like this in the theology of, uh, of the Christian uh, uh, community. And what I was trying to do was complicate it a little bit more or, um, or get us thinking about what's really behind, um, oh my God. What, what was really behind what they did? Like, I know for myself, and I'm going to talk about this more next week, for example, I know that so much of, you know, when I mess up or when I, you know, find myself uh, you know, telling a, telling a half-truth or, you know, whatever, it's because I'm ashamed. It's because I feel like, you know, I want to be seen as a good mother. Or I want to be seen as, you know, and, and if I feel like, you know, that's a threat, then I've got to, you know, like, make it look better or than it is or something, right? I don't think we're big lawyers, most of us here that come to church, right? But sometimes we, you know, we, we're feeling kind of embarrassed about something, and then we tell it, we don't tell it straight. We tell it a little slant because we're protecting ourselves and our image or, right? And if we didn't feel bad about ourselves, we could just be honest about things, right? You know, like, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I told you guys that story about, you know, the time I, that I was supposed to go pick up my husband and the kids that they had come back from vacation and I was late, as is my custom. And, you know, I was like, Oh, honey, you know, I'm sorry that the Clinton motorcade was, you know, right outside New York airport and it slowed me down and, you know, it wasn't true. You know? <laughs> and, and then he said, you know, well, if Carol, you know, if you had just stopped at the mall on your way to the airport and got a little late, that would be okay too. But I, if I felt like I could just say, honey, I'm so sorry, I screwed up and I stayed too long at the mall and but I felt so bad, you know, like what kind of wife and mother doesn't, you know, hasn't seen her two little boys in a week and her husband and stays too long at the, you know, like, I don't know. This is the kind of thing. So I'm thinking in the story in the garden, something's behind what they do. Something else is happening. And I think it's this bit, the failure of them to believe that the boundary that God sets up for them, the you know, when God tells them, okay, you know, here's here's what it means to be human, here's what I want you to do, and here's your vocation in the world, and here's a blessing and all that. But I'm gonna set up, you know, some some boundaries in the garden. You, you know, you kind of we need to live in God's world on God's terms. And I think they were okay with that in the beginning until the serpent brought forward this possibility that maybe God didn't want them to have this good new thing, which was knowledge of you know, good and evil. Why would God withhold that from you? Is God a withholder? No, what is what's the problem? What, what's God trying to do? Right? And I think that when we have stuff that's in our mind that's kind of messing with our perception of things, we run the risk of doing stupid stuff like, you know, not listening and going our own way or being disobedient to what God has said. Right? What do you guys think? 
what when you you know what's your understanding like when you grew up in church what what did you all what did you think the fall was about is that what you wanted to, to answer no okay that's okay you can tell us any you can ask a different question um, well, I was just kind of uh, picturing what the serpent looks like today, uh -huh. and right. um, basically that person telling you, oh, you you don't have to go to church every Sunday, mm -hmm. you don't need to read your Bible right. every day, yeah. God still loves you, That's right. it's okay, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. So is the serpent necessarily an evil creature, or is it basically a revealer? of who God is and who what God's personality is like. Yes, God wants you to go to church every Sunday. Yes, he wants you to read your Bible every day. But how can we change what we do, but at the same time, love God? Mm -hmm. That's great. Anybody want to piggyback on that? Say something more about it, David? Yeah. I was just going to mention, in a lot of ways, this is this is a children's story, um, and uh, like a child, the temptation is to want to do whatever it is you're told not to. Right. Yep. There's that too. Yeah. Yep. And that is the whole root of sin, isn't it? To do something that you're told you should not do, and it's not necessarily because it's bad for you or good for you. It's just if you're told not to do it. It always makes it a lot sweeter to be told no. <laughs> I, yes, I, so I definitely think we have that propensity. I don't know what it is, but if somebody tells you not to do something, then it just piques our curiosity. It's the one thing we want to do, right? Um, it's, I don't know. Yeah, okay, so Astrid and then Daryl. So I just um, wanted to ask the question that's probably on a lot of our minds right now. And God made this garden, he made this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then he told them not to eat of it. Why did he tell them that? Is it knowledge <laughs> of good and evil a good thing that they would need to understand if they're sinning or not sinning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question. Not everything makes sense in the story right or it's not particularly logical and i you know and i do think that's a problem that we have with this story i remember um you know people asking me things like you know why did you know if if god knew that adam and eve were going to sin why did he even give them that opportunity which i guess is kind of what you're asking astrid right like did god one right so it's kind of a setup honestly <laughs> <laughs> okay all right daryl well on friday night we discussed how prior to them eating the fruit they were innocent they were like children right and the last thing you do if you have a toddler in the house is put what you don't want them to touch right in the middle of the house <laughs> right it's like here, bang, bang, here's the neon sign, right? Um, so the question came about what was God up to? Mm -hmm. Right? What was this all part of God's intention mm -hmm. for them to eventually get the knowledge of good and evil, but they circumvented the timeline? Uh, yes. Perhaps. Yes, some people did, yes, some that's kind of what there's definitely that is one of the interpretations of what's what's happened, you know, that they would get it eventually, but they they went after it earlier than they should have. And then the one question that I think that that people probably don't want to talk about because it's weird, it's a children's story, it's a whatever, right, is this talking serpent, right? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. When did the serpent uh, become, in the minds of Christians, Satan? So the serpent is not meant to be Satan. Um, the first time we we have anything with that with that name, Satan, is in the book of Job, which is an old story. But um, uh, you know, Satan in Hebrew 
just means adversary or or um accuser. you know sorry. accuser right the accuser he's like the accusing angel um and uh and so um it was far later in the i would say in the in this last part of um you know the couple of centuries before Jesus is born, before, you know, we, we you know, like in the part where there's intertestamental material, that's probably when, um, you know, there, I, I don't know the history of doctrine as well as some, some scholars do, but um, I think it was the influence of Zoroastrianism, which was the prevailing religion in the area of Babylon and Iran, like at southern, like in what is today Iran. And they were much more dualistic thinkers that there's good and evil, and that, you know, there's got to be somebody else. There's God, and then there's this evil opponent of God's, and that both things sort of exist. And then they went looking in scripture and found that thing about, you know, like I saw, you know, this angel fall to the ground, and, you know, so this is the thing. It's surprising to me that so many um, doctrinal ideas and things that are just kind of accepted, widely accepted in the church, grew up from so little evidence in the Bible, like so few verses and one or two particular interpretations. And um and and um you know every person who was writing the bible what you know the bible's is like written over a long period of time many hundreds of years right is always experiencing their faith and thinking about god in relation to everything else that's happening historically and socially in their time and so you might have like when I think even about Paul, when Paul goes on to say, you know, it's like just like sin entered the world through one man, Adam, um, and death followed for everybody. Then, you know, um, redemption comes into the world through one man, Jesus, right? And I'm thinking, okay, so that that and two other texts kind of led to this whole idea of original sin, which is like, you know, we're all born in sin and in the Catholic um, theological world, you know, they believe that a baby is born and they're born sinful and damned to eternal uh, hell. And that's why you got to baptize that baby right away. You know, you don't want that baby to die before it's baptized or it won't make it to heaven. And, you know, it's like, Okay, <laughs> so little evidence for anything like that, and yet it's like takes root and you know, kind of <laughs> like goes deep into the ground and starts growing up into something bigger than it probably means to be or needs to be. And, um, you know, it's it's like crazy to me. Church tradition takes a lot of, and, and that's it's a big leg of our lens that we use to interpret exactly it. because especially you know um there was just one church for the longest time right and there were you know the started in jerusalem and then as jesus gave the great commandment you know they started planting churches in you know judea and samaria and all to the ends of the earth right all around the mediterranean world and um eventually the church split between east and west and, you know, the Eastern churches became the Eastern Orthodox churches, and the Western church became Roman Catholicism, because, you know, the Roman Empire was huge. But, you know, when, you know, <laughs> eventually it just became like the Bishop of Rome was the Pope. And, you know, okay. And for both of those sets of, of uh, church faith, um, communities, the Bible and church teaching or church tradition were kind of held up as the same. 
They were, you know, just as important as what's in the Bible is what these bishops and scholars and, you know, and other Christian leaders had to say. And by the time you get the reformers like Martin Luther and, and Calvin and John Knox and Melanchthon and, you know, like all these guys that were like, no way, you know, you human, that's just human stuff. We got to go back to the scripture. And if the scripture doesn't say it, we're not going to teach it. So that's where sola scriptura, right? Scripture alone, right? Becomes like the big thing for the reformed tradition like us. We, you know, we don't, you know, whatever the Pope says, I guess that's fine. He can say that, but we don't give weight to that as Presbyterians because we're in the reformed tradition and we just go to scripture. And even, you know, even among the reformers, Calvin and Luther had a different idea about this. Luther thought, well, as long as the Bible doesn't say not to do it, it's okay. Oh. And Calvin said, no way. We're only going to do what the Bible says to do. Right? And so Lutherans became a lot closer to Catholic in the way they worship, their worship style, and, you know, and some of the other things that, uh, you know, their hierarchy of, you know, bishops and pastors and then lay people and, you know, on, on it goes. But Calvin was even more extreme. He said, unless the Bible says it, we're not teaching it. Unless the Bible says it, we're not doing it. Right? Okay, Adam. <laughs> We, we work on this um, work on this Friday night and same stuff in our Bible study. So I've been thinking about this a lot. Yeah. And when you were talking this morning, I was trying to put myself in Eve's place. Mm -hmm. And she gets asked this question, right? And I'm thinking, what would that, just being asked that question, what would that do? And to me, it would create confusion. Right. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how confusion fits into this whole picture. Yeah. Well, I, I called it the seeds of doubt. Um, you know, it, it is confusing. It's like, well, you know, did God say blank? Did God really say that? Did God mean that? You know, what do you understand, Eve, you know, for this for this thing? And, you know, sort of creating, a, you know, a, a sense that she can't really trust her own judgment about something. That, you know, God has spoken to her or spoken to her and Adam, the original couple, and, and suddenly they're not, they're, they start not trusting what they knew because they're confused by it. And somebody else, some, you know, they, um, Martin Luther also said, you know, the serpent was the first theologian. <laughs> the first theologian, <laughs> the one who was talking about God in the third person, as opposed to talking with God in that, you know, loving I, thou relationship, the me and God which I was trying to say is all they knew up to that point. They just talked to God. And now the serpent comes and is making, you know, putting God in the third person. So if you're feeling confusion for the first time, wouldn't fear come along with that? For sure. So then what do you do with that? Well, I wonder, you know, I mean, in a way, the serpent tries to allay her fears about dying, whatever that means. If there was no death <laughs> until that point, you know, like, there's going to be, well, and if that happens to that very day you eat of it, you'll die. Well, what's dying? You know, like, what is, what is that? We don't, we have no knowledge of, of what that is supposed to be. Um, but, okay. And the serpent is basically saying, um, yeah, God didn't mean that. You don't need to be afraid of that. You, you, you know, I think fear of, well, the fears 
come, but we're really going to see next week what the fallout of this whole thing is, right? And I think it will, I think it will be, what we're talking about today is going to become even more clear when we see how the story unfolds. Um, but I don't know. Do you have a thought about the fear part, Adam? In my experience in working with human beings is that fear is one of the roots of all emotional problems. Right. And, and confusion is chaos. And so in the garden, they were in a closed system, right? right. And all of a sudden, a new factor is introduced to the system. The whole system starts to spin out. Right. That's as far as I've gotten. Well, you know, and it makes so much sense, doesn't it? I mean, look at all of the messed up things that happen in society, things that people do because they're afraid, because they're afraid of someone who's different. Because they're afraid of what the, um, you know, like, if I don't do this, I'm going to be fear of missing out, right? With FOMO. Um, there's so much, so many things that we do fear-based. And those things, living out of fear, is almost, almost certainly going to lead to a downward spiral. Our best decisions are never made out of fear but out of trust, okay? And that's why I feel like you're, you're getting at what I, was, what I was hoping we would see in this text, that there's something else motivating their bad behavior. And I was trying to say, it's, it's a lack of faith that God, it's a lack of trust, that they don't trust what God has said to them. They can't, you know, they, they don't, they don't, they, they, they aren't sure it's true anymore. They aren't sure that God really wants good things for them, right? Maybe God is, is that maybe that thing in the tree and that fruit is really good. Why wouldn't God want us to have it, right? And so many missteps in the Bible are the same thing, right? Like Abraham and Sarah. Well, I don't, you know, we're past childbearing age. We better, you know, let's pull in us your maidservant and see if we can generate a few children here since God promised that we're going to have a big family. It's that lack of trust. And it just like gets like big mess as a result. And fear, same thing. Yeah, David. I wanted to get back to the knowledge of good and evil for a minute. Yeah, sure. Um, the idea of that is to that they wanted to become like God. And that seems to be a recurring theme at different points. It happened in Babylon, the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the, I think that there's criticism of missionaries because they are bringing the knowledge of good and evil to people that are innocent. That maybe they would have been better off without that knowledge. Today, and and you'd have to say that it, that maybe it, as Daryl mentioned earlier, maybe it was a timing issue that they were getting this knowledge before their time, because since then we've gone so far beyond the Tower of Babel. If the if the Babylonians were cursed because of that, then we must be triply cursed by now. Oh yeah. And today. A lot of people are thinking that maybe AI is going to be the next step that maybe we're gone, we've gone too far. Yeah, um, I yeah, I tried to play with that idea a little bit. It was underdeveloped in my sermon on the Tower of Babel that you know we're we're playing around with fire with things that are um, you know beyond what beyond the boundaries of what are what it means to be human if we're trying to press beyond that so we can have all this other knowledge the kind of knowledge generated by a computer not not a human right and these other things that um you know i think that's definitely one of, you know think about the you know how many like there's this big trend those guys down in silicon valley Ugh. they all want to live forever 
they're like starving themselves, right? There's these men that are like, oh, well, this is the way you can, you know, live for until you're 110. And, you know, and they're, they're like trying to, aiming for immor immortality. Or, you know, I want somebody to freeze my brain in that, you know, cryo, you know, whatever it is, the icing, putting your body on ice so you can bring me back 20 years from now. It's like, what? But it's like, we're, we don't like the limits that come to us. And whether, you know, like, again, this is a story with a theological point. And, you know, people don't like the conclusion, you know, that this story brings us, which is, um, you know, we, we don't have um, free reign in this world. We don't. We, that's what I kept trying to say. The language that, that helps me is we have to live in God's world on God's terms, not what not what we want, not you know. Sin and death are realities, and if we think we can do a workaround by some of these you know technological advances or you know whatever, or just eating the right seeds and nuts and you know like. Right? Have you been seeing that in the paper? There's like all these yeah. people that are trying to live to forever. Yeah. What do you think? I think I speak loud, but not too much. Um, I don't think uh, building the tower or any of those things were the main problem. It was the purpose. Why they did it. Is always because they had a motive, and the motive was to be not subservient to God, but they taking reign and being responsible for creating all this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think because we have been creating and God allowed us all that. Even I think uh, Adam and, and Eve, I don't think the problem was that they did is to say, You're going to be like God, you're going to have this knowledge. So it's that thing that we want to be responsible in the, starting with ourselves, with whatever it is, and responsible for everything else. And responsible not to take care, but to know that we are in top of it. Yeah. And 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 we have to be accountable for what we now know, too. Right? But in, in, in that story about the tower, I was trying to make, I was trying to suggest that. Um, you know, they did it out of fear, like Adam said. They, you know, they they imagined that some of their other neighbors would come and, you know, wipe them out. And so, like, let's build a big tower and, you know, like, make ourselves look like we're really strong and, and nobody will challenge us. And they were sort of circling the wagons and being fearful of the others that, are, that, that they were living around. It wasn't like creativity for creativity's sake, or like, you know, I'm going to compose a song, you know, I mean, that's kind of like the good kind of creating, right? And this other stuff that grows out of fear or mistrust is, you know, when we go off the rails. I think it's like pride. Pride. So, to be a, higher, a taller tower than anyone else. <laughs> well, so here's one thing that I was going to suggest. Um, you know, we talk a lot about pride um, in the church. We talk about pride, a lot of great literature, um, you know, like you remember from high school English class, it's like every novel you read or every play or whatever, it was like, you know, the, the protagonist had like their big downfall and what was it, hubris, right, pride. And if we weren't so prideful, you know, maybe we wouldn't be in, you know, all the trouble that we're in all the time. But, um, but as I said last time, you know, all these women theologians have started looking at the same text now. And, um, and there's a, a, a woman who wrote her doctoral dissertation 
Um, she was actually uh, Jewish and was a student at uh, Union Seminary in New York City. And um, her book was called Sex, Sin, and Grace. And she was trying to say that if you look at all of the theologians that have written about the problem of the fall or sin, and she was looking at like Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich, and all these are like really big name 20th century theologians. And she saw it said, they all talk about pride. It's all about pride. And she said, but women are not prone to pride in the same way that men are. That's what she said. And I wonder what you guys think of her argument. She said men are socialized in the world to trust their own agency. You know, men can be prideful. Women are told, you're second class. You stay in the kitchen. You know, you don't get to come out and be part of the public dialogue on things. You know, you're, you know, women probably rather than experiencing sin as pride, don't think enough of themselves. Like if men think too highly of themselves, women don't think highly enough of themselves. And both are distortions of re recognizing who we are as those created in the image of God, male and female. Our co-humanity, where we're both the same, or we're, we're equal, and we're both expressive of the character of God in the, in the world and the qualities of, of, of God's character. And so she said, you know, we've got to backtrack a little bit here and not just assume that everyone experiences sin the same way. What do you think? Do you think women and men experience sin differently? Or do you think people by their social class might experience sin differently? Do you think, you know, like in, in, in a country like India that is so broken down by, you know, these yeah. very discreet and, and um, you know, um, uh, yes. Yes. fast and solid social yes. class, castes, right? Are the Brahmins who are up top experiencing sin differently than the untouchables? What do you think? Or sin is sin, and we're all we all have the problem of being prideful sometimes, and we all have the problem of not thinking highly enough of ourselves sometimes. And it's really not about gender or your experience in the world. What do you think? Yeah. I, I agree that it's, it's experienced differently by different people because of their experience and their experience. Um, it crosses every kind of boundary you can probably think of. Um, but the thing that I was really interested in was from your sermon, you said something that really piqued my interest. You said sin preceded yes. us, mm -hmm. right? And I don't, I will almost guarantee that anybody in this room probably hasn't heard that mm -hmm. before because we've been indoctrinated to believe that the sin came to us through this act of disobedience and all this stuff, right? right? But when you said that there was already loneliness in the garden, there was already the, the you know, the shrewd serpent in the garden. There was already, there were already things that God, I mean, the tree right in the middle where they get it, there were already things in the garden okay. that were not pure necessarily, right? So I just wanted to comment that that, that idea was very freeing to me when you said sin preceded us. Mm -hmm. And and it, that makes a lot more sense. I heard somebody once say that if sin didn't profit or heal them, we wouldn't do it. Right. <laughs> right. right. If, if, if it didn't profit us in some way or it didn't feel good in some way, right. we wouldn't do it. Right. So, and fear, I think, is a big deal too. Michelle, what do you think, Michelle? Oh, um, so, what would it? What that brings up to me is the idea of free will. Right. And um, is that the genesis or the beginning of, of free will? And maybe free will, or maybe the choice to eat from the tree was um, an act of compassion on God's part in the sense that 
if we choose to love him, that's real love. And if you're forced to call us, then you're just a time time. And, and maybe that was the point where we just made the wrong choice and maybe it's a simple decision. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't talk too much about this. I'll get to you in just a second, Pastor. Um, but when we when we were talking about what does it mean to be created in the image of God, and I gave you a few possibilities. One was it means we're created as relational beings, because look in the in the divine, the person of God, God's very self, there's relationships, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? The three in one. And so being relational is one of the things that it means to be created in God's image. I talked about being created in God's image as being like God's representatives on this earth, where you know, where like we appear. <laughs> where God does not personally appear to do God's bidding. We're like God's agents, right? We, what did I say? That we have the power of attorney. Yes. And, you know, it belongs to God, but we make the decisions, right? Um, and so the, the main thing that for years and years, like hundreds of years in Christian theology, systematic theologians said being created in the image of God meant being created with free will. That God doesn't, you know, um, and but you see, these things are all debated for, you know, generations within the church, because some people think God is, you know, like, like um, the whole idea of predestination, which often gets associated with Calvin, though it wasn't really, the way it got played out wasn't really what Calvin meant by it, but the idea that everything that happens, happens because, because God wills it. Versus, no, we're we're free agents, and you know the stuff that happens, like so, like I, you know, like when I started to write my prayer for today, I I was thinking to myself, gosh darn, like I'm sick of praying the same prayers about the wars going on, and, you know, I thought, what, well, well, you know, God says that just keep praying, don't lose heart. But it's like this doesn't depend on God just saying, well, I'm going to stop all the wars. Because humans choose to make wars with each other, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's our will. That's why we pray not our will, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because when we exercise our will, we just screw it all up. If I could choose a phrase. <laughs> So I think to go back to the um, idea of pride, and you know, I mean, we're taught, and I'm not, I'm honestly not even sure if this is scriptural, but we're taught that it's the chief of sins, um, that it's kind of top of the pyramid that everything else kind of trickles down from there. And uh, I think as Adam pointed out, that there's a very close tie between pride and fear. I think we're prideful in any time because we're insecure. But look at the um, typical, you know, quote unquote male um, response to pride, and that is, you know, I'm the best, I'm better than anybody, I can do it, I got this, right. uh, you the man, you know. Um, then you take what we would call the stereotypical female experience, and it's like, I, I can't do it, I'm not as good as so and so, I'm not able, you know, I'm dirt. Um, what do these two narratives have in common? It's I, I, I. It's me, yeah. me, me. If you think of pride as being full of yourself, then right. yeah, it falls more in that category. But if we think of pride as self-centeredness, mm -hmm. both are equally prideful. Yes. I think, I think, okay, so I appreciate that, Astrid. I would say you're right, because you can be equally self-obsessed from a negative point of view, yeah. right? hating ourselves or, you know, staring in a mirror all day and saying how ugly we are and, you know, this stuff we do. And I feel like you're right. It, it kind of, it's not as different as it seems. But it, but at the heart of it is a distortion. We don't, we don't see ourselves right. And that's why when we come to church on Sunday morning, we're getting reoriented you know, sometimes we need to come on Wednesday, too, because like, it doesn't take more than a couple of days for us to get off track because we're, you know, the, the pull is so strong. 
But, you know, when we come to church, we hear once again, this is who you are. You are the, a baptized child of God. You don't have to, you know, puff yourself up. And you don't have to believe the worst of yourself. Both of those things are untrue. But when we go searching around for our worth and our value and, you know, well, how much money do I make? Or what's my title? And, you know, what kind of car do I drive? And, you know, that kind of stuff. Look, <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's, it's like a losing cause if we're, if we're judging ourselves based on that stuff. And it's so sad. And so, you know, like that's what our culture is telling us, right? You gotta look like you know these people and you know have these kind of clothes and this kind of you know car and job and you know live in these cities and you know I mean like it's just all such lies. Those voices are loud. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually a new generation that I've come across. They've taken the cuspers between baby boomers and Gen X. From 56 to 63, they call them the Joneses, mm. keeping up with the Joneses generation. Mm -hmm. And that's where the name came from. It's like, wow, you know, that's so pertinent with our society kind of on hold. You know, everybody wants to have the next best thing. How many times do you see people lining up for blocks to get the newest iPhone when the one they got works just great? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good example. I didn't know they knew who the Joneses were. Is it that <laughs> where they're living now in their basement? <laughs> yeah, uh, Adam. I have a question, and I'm not sure what you have to ask it. Pick up that more I don't even know how to ask this question. I don't know if I know enough theology to make any sense of it. But, um, Jesus left us the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. Right? Yep. And I experience my understanding of the Holy Spirit is grace. It's grace in the world. Mm -hmm. And I've always experienced women as being graceful, not men. <laughs> and I wonder if that fits into the theology that you're presenting us as far as that works in our understanding of the feminine aspects of the world of God. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, I tried to show using the Hebrew root uh, for racham or rachamim, um, that is the word for womb in Hebrew. And the same root, those same three consonants, it's kind of like sing, sang, sung, you know, you're just changing a vowel in there, but it's S-N-G, it's all around the same semantic feel, right, of singing. It's around the woman's, um, you know, physiology of childbearing and having a womb is the word for mercy. Whenever God says, I am the Lord, I am gracious and merciful, that root is off of the word for womb. You know, that's what I was trying to say. You know, there's these feminine qualities about God or, you know, where God, you know, bears the people and births the people. And, you know, we're, the, we're God's children. And, you know, and, and it's not just in a fatherly way, but in a motherly way, too. And so I do think that you know there are specific things that are more common or more rooted in in women's biology and physiology that make us like we don't have like uh, all the same t testosterone that's going on in you guys right like i once saw i watched that movie fight club you know that movie with brad pitt <laughs> Yeah, like, I'm not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> right? I had to watch that movie like five times, and I still, for the life of me, cannot understand it. Like, I don't know, like, what is it that makes men want to fight each other? It's just like, you know, this boxing thing. And I, I, it doesn't occur to me. 
So I do think we're, you know, there are differences and they're not bad. And I think that's one of the things, you know, like in the women's movement, we're always like swinging from one pendulum to the other end of the pendulum, right? You know, like we're just exactly the same. And yes, we want to go to war and be, you know, draft us and put us out on the front lines and all that, or no, we're totally different than men. And, you know, like we have nothing in common with them and, you know, like, and that's a good thing. It should be, you know, we've got to find our like way back into the, right? Yeah. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Any Anybody else want to weigh in on this or? You know, we bring your questions next Sunday because you know we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about how this all plays out. And I love that David that you were thinking and um um uh both of you were thinking about. I call it. I'm just looking at you and going, Diana. And I know that's not right. Cheryl. Cheryl, Cheryl, of course, of course, Cheryl. That both Cheryl and David were saying. You know, here's what I think it looks like today. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a lot of that next Sunday. You know, first we got to understand the story and what we think the story is telling us about the nature of God and about our human nature. And then we can see, wow, look, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. Did we expect anything else? Right. And how do we... How do we respond in a way that you know is faithfully pulling pulling the way of God back into the conversation? Because I, I feel like you know, sometimes I think we're sitting over here at the church and we're having our Bible study and we're doing our Sunday school class and we're talking about all this stuff, and then we go home and like where to go, you know, like it it's just you know, we're like it's all the the bad news on the news and all the people fighting with each other and getting upset about this and that and all the rest of it. And I think, you know, um, we have something to say about our current moment. And, um, you know, we, we have a perspective about the way things are. And what what needs to happen and what has been done to fix it, right? I mean, the whole redemptive story, you know, we 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 have the Old Testament and the New Testament put together. You know, the story of Jesus, and I guess that was kind of back to you know Astrid's original question, which is like, did God, you know, like was Jesus hanging out up there in heaven? It was like okay, one day you're going to have to go down there and save them all, you know, but first they got to make these bad choices, <laughs> you know, like, I don't think we can know something like that, right? I don't think we really need to know. People love, that's like, you know, how many angels are dancing on a pin, you know, I mean, like, I don't know. I feel like we just have to say um, that God does not leave us dead in our sin. Because God is Savior and a healer and one who wants to bring wellness and wholeness and peace and shalom, wellness, wholeness, peace to the world. And, you know, we can be confident of that. And that's why I don't want to give up. All right. So let's say a quick prayer. God of grace, your, uh, your way with us is, you know, what did Paul say? It's like too marvelous. <laughs> We, we can't really, it's too high, we can't attain it. It's too wonderful, we can't really understand it. And we're okay with that. But we want to, we want to draw nearer to you. 
we want to have a deeper feeling for what you have done and what you are doing even today, not only in our lives and in our church, our community, but in the world, in human history. And we pray that you would, um, as you have sent your Holy Spirit, let your spirit do its work. We are lost without your spirit doing its work in the world. Help us to be responsive. Help us to be open-hearted and pliable and willing to let you turn us into the kind of people who, who live as you would have us live. Thank you for, for our church, for this opportunity to worship you and to learn together. We, again, as always, we just pray that the, that the things that were true and most helpful, that you help us to remember those things and other things that weren't particularly on track or on target. We just kind of like no longer, because we don't want to get, we don't want to have bad theology. <laughs> we want to try to have good theology if you help us. So um, join us. I, accompany us as we go 